All right, man, peace. So as all of you brothers know that follow the NBA, they've been promoting the LeBron James home opener against the Houston Rockets for the past month or so. And lo and behold, LeBron James became an afterthought in that game because a 10 year long beef between Rajon Rondo and Chris Paul bubbled to the surface and it resulted in a relatively big brawl by NBA standards, or at least by modern NBA standards. To me, that brawl set off a chain effect that eventually is going to lead to the dissolution of this current Los Angeles Laker roster because a lot of things were revealed and not all of them were bad. But sometimes just because something isn't bad doesn't mean that it's not going to be perceived as bad by those who were directly involved in the incident. People's relationships oftentimes get altered by traumatic events or adverse conditions, even when no one involved meant ill. But in this situation, there were certain people who meant ill. Either way, you find out how close you are with someone and what someone's loyalties actually are when those traumatic situations go down. So anyway, they're gonna talk about it and I'm gonna chime in. All right, okay. guys, let's get it. So obviously a lot happening in sports. We're gonna start with the NBA, but don't you worry, we got a lot of NFL to get into in just a bit. So here's the deal. The NBA suspended the Lakers' Brandon Ingram four games, Rajon Rondo three games, and the Rockets' Chris Paul two, all without pay for their roles in the fourth quarter fight Saturday at the Lakers' home opener, which was started when Rondo spit in the face of Chris Paul yesterday. Look, as it's already been revealed, Rajon Rondo and Chris Paul, they've had a distaste, a serious dislike, an antipathy for one another going back 10 years. Remember, I believe that Rajon Rondo came into the NBA in 2006. I think that CP3 came into the league in 2005. If I'm wrong about that, one of you brothers can correct me. So they've been pretty much contemporaries over the course of the last decade plus in the NBA. And many people may forget this especially with the prominence of Steph Curry and Russell Westbrook and Damian Lillard and Kyrie Irving and also CP3 right alongside those other players. But there was a time about six to eight years ago where Rajon Rondo was considered the best point guard in the NBA. At the start of the 2010s, Rajon Rondo was pretty much considered the best point guard in the league until he tore up his knee. And right around that time period, Chris Paul, was right there along with Deron Williams as being considered amongst the best point guards in the NBA. Now Chris Paul has pretty much been able to transcend over Deron Williams but it wasn't until Rajon Rondo got hurt that CP3 truly was considered the best pure point guard in the league. In the aftermath of that brawl on Saturday night, Paul Pierce stated that he was surprised that it took that long for those two players to have that fight. And just thinking about it, I thought to myself the same thing, because they're pretty much mirror images of one another. Both players are extremely cerebral. The difference is that I think that Rondo likes to let everybody know how smart he is, just a little bit more than Chris Paul. But they're very much alike. And oftentimes, people who are too much alike, they repel one another, especially when they have strong personalities. And especially when they tend to be as disrespectful as both of those players tend to be. So it was pretty much only a matter of time. Yesterday, Mike D'Antoni with his thoughts on the suspensions. I don't agree in anything close to him. It's just not equitable. I agree with you, Mike D'Antoni. I would have given Brandon Ingram anywhere from eight to 10 games. I would have given Rajon Rondo anywhere from six to eight games, maybe even nine games. And I would have given Chris Paul probably two games. It's not equitable. And if you watch the film, you watch the spit, you watch this and that, it's just, you know, I understand maybe he gets one, but, you know, how does he not, I mean, what is he supposed to do? Just stand there and get spit on and then take a face, a uh, punch in the face and then say, well, that's okay. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, they're doing the best they can do. It's a hard situation. I understand that. So we'll go on. Uh, it's a relatively hard situation, but that's what you pay them for. They're paid to make hard decisions. And I do agree with D'Antoni here. I think that the suspensions were not as equitable as they should have been. Uh, Stephen A, you were there in the building, Max, you as well, obviously I flew back for fantasy. What was your reaction to the fight? Well, first of all, I thought that Brandon Ingram was the biggest instigator. That's number one. First of Not only was he the biggest instigator, but let me say this. Watch for there to be some situations with that team because you have a bunch of young players who have not been subjected to this level of pressure ever at any point in their careers. 
Brandon Ingram, probably the most pressure that he's ever faced prior to this season was that one year at Duke, where you have those type of expectations to win. He hasn't faced that since he's gotten into the NBA. So like they say, you know, pressure can be used to bust pipes, but it can also be used to create diamonds. And we're going to find out. But just to get back to the point, I'll be touching on this later on in the video. Whether or not you agree with the fact that LeBron James went to pull CP3 out of the fight as opposed to his own guy, I personally don't think that it's a big deal. I've seen many altercations where players who were friends on opposite teams, they went to one another to hold each other back. It's not a big deal. I remember back in 1995, the Bulls played the New York Knicks and Ron Harper and Patrick Ewing, they got into a little altercation and Michael Jordan ran over to Patrick Ewing and held him back because they were very close friends. So it is what it is. It happens all the time. It's nothing new. But it's not about how I perceive it. It's about how Rajon Rondo perceives it because he is LeBron James' teammate, at least for now. And we all know that Rajon Rondo is hyper-perceptive. And he could have seen LeBron James running to Chris Paul as deciding that he was going to turn against his teammates. And as we all know, Rajon Rondo has a track record of being very confrontational with teammates in the locker room not caring about what their status is as players in the NBA. He doesn't care. So it's something to watch for. I think that that might be the first crack. That, that might be the first chink in the armor in regards to the, the eventual, in my view, the eventual dissolution of the rapport between Rondo and LeBron. First of all, James Harden was driving to the basket. We all know what happens. He usually draws contact. He could have easily been called for an offensive foul. Fair enough. Absolutely. It's not that James Harden draws contact. See, what he does that frustrates players is that he plays like a running back. Other than LeBron James, James Harden is probably the best one-man fast break in the NBA right now, especially because he has wide shoulders and he's built like a football player or a rugby player. And what he does is he initiates contact and then he flails his arms and snaps his head back to make it look like he's the one who got hit. And that will frustrate defensive players who are not experienced. And then in this NBA... If you touch these offensive players, they're going to blow the whistle on the defense. Uh, but uh, Brandon Ingram was frustrated by that, getting called for the foul while uh, James Harden was looking at the referee. Brandon Ingram shoved him in the back. Uh, James Harden wanted to retaliate, but was smart enough not to. And then Brandon Ingram stupidly got in the face of official Jason Phillips. You know it's bad when Lance Stevenson runs over to you to calm you down and to get you out of the official's face. That's bad in and of itself. But then at that particular moment, Look at Bron. Bron grabbed Chris Paul like, hey, 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 this is my night. Don't fuck with my night. <laughs> particular moment, Rondo and Chris Paul, who have never liked each other, and it spans for as, as long as a decade, uh, you know, back to 2008 and beyond, uh, they ultimately draw one another. And then you can see Chris Paul wiping something from his face. Look, it's very obvious that Rajon Rondo purposefully spit on Chris Paul. Like, that's not even, to me, up for dispute. And puts his finger and mushes uh, Rondo in the face, basically intimating that Rondo spit on him. Rondo throws a punch, he connects. Chris Paul they get in a scuffle. Chris Paul catches him with an uppercut. LeBron James grabs him, and Chris Paul is is, is screaming at LeBron. He spit in my face. He spit in my face. Then he walked over uh, to our team, uh, calling the game for ABC. Mark Jackson, Jeff Van Gundy, and Mike Breen. And Chris Paul told them that Ron. I tell you what, man. Age oftentimes does bring wisdom, fortunately, because had Carmelo Anthony and some of those other players on the floor been seven or eight years younger, this could have been way worse. Because as we all remember, Carmelo Anthony was once involved in a situation like this as a member of the Denver Nuggets when Nate Robinson got into it with that other nutcase, J.R. Smith, and Carmelo Anthony pretty much did what Brandon Ingram did here. Had Carmelo been seven or eight years younger, P.J. Tuck, a lot of those guys, who knows? It, it might have been a full-on brawl out there on the basketball court. Rondo spit in my face. After the game, I spoke to James Harden, who was furious. Uh, he was definitely furious at Brandon Ingram, but he was also furious at, at, um, at Rondo, saying, what is Chris Paul supposed to do? And what have you? And then ultimately, they left the arena. Uh, you know, there... Yeah, he obviously spit on him there. Thereafter, we saw the video late at night because even though I saw it and you saw some of it in terms of the number of replays that I saw, it clearly looked like Rondo spit in his face. Rondo and his team were denying that that was the case intentionally. 
but when you look at the video, it looks very, very clear that Rondo tried to get away with slickly uh, spitting in Chris Paul's face. Obviously, and let me say this, Rondo was very fortunate that Chris Paul was able to moderate his temper to a certain degree because certain players would have hooked off on him right there and his chin was wide open. And so that's really what this comes down to. It's real hard to blame Chris Paul. A, a suspension is automatic because in today's day and age, ever since the, the mall at the brawl at the palace in Auburn Hills, any kind of physical contact, it's going to wait. If you throw a punch, it's going to warrant a, a suspension. That's a given. Uh, so I knew a suspension was coming for all three. But it's really, really hard to look at Chris Paul and find fault in this particular situation because Brandon Ingram was certainly an instigator. And in the case of Rajon Rondo, you simply don't do what that man did. It just, it just something. It's it's certain things that's just crossing the line. I don't give a damn who it is. When something like that happens, it's time to throw down. So you're not going to find a single NBA player anywhere, or uh, anybody watching that is as well. That's going to put the point the finger in the direction of Chris Paul in regards to what happened. You just I agree with that, Stephen A. Smith. I agree with most of what you stated. But the real question is, so what now for the L.A. Lakers? Because this is a very young, fragile team still trying to find some level of cohesiveness. And that fight certainly did not help. And they're still winless at this point in the season. They're playing terrible defense. As we know, they have to play the LeBron James system. And they're playing way too fast. And I stated this in another video. There's no way in the world that they're going to be able to play with this type of pace for the entire season. You can already see that LeBron James is very uncomfortable playing at that pace. It's wearing him out. You're just not going to find that today. It is difficult to talk about this situation honestly on national TV and responsibly. But I'm going to try. Because the truth of the matter is, everyone, like I was entertained by it. Everyone I know was entertained by this. Everyone seemed to find it entertaining. Now we have to come... Right, but what does that really mean? You found it entertaining. I find great basketball entertaining. Every once in a while, there's a certain shock value to a fight that happens on a basketball court. But I don't find that entertaining. Like, I'm not somebody who goes on YouTube and does a search for basketball fights. If I want to see fights, I watch boxing. So for Max Kellerman to state that he finds that entertaining, it's very clear, as I've stated about him in other videos, he's someone who just looks at other people, especially black athletes, even though he'll deny this. In his subconscious, he just looks at black athletes as, uh, as meat, as cattle. Come on TV and there has to be a lot of hand-wringing about how it's a bad example, of course. It's irresponsible to encourage fighting, of course. I get it, but this was exciting. This kind of took over everything. This was the biggest story out of the game. This is what we're talking about still on Monday. This happened. Well, this was a big story, but this was not the biggest story out of this game in my view. The biggest story out of this game, in my view, is that the Lakers have a lot of talented players. And it's going to be very interesting to see if LeBron James can be the leader that so many of you puppets in the mainstream liberal sports media claim him to be. And he can assist them in being able to raise to their optimal potential. That's what I got out of this game. Because they were right there with the Houston Rockets for a very long time. Saturday night. Now, you do not want this to catch on in the NBA and fights. It's been a long time since we saw a genuine fist fight on the court in the NBA where guys were actually landing punches and to pretend that we weren't entertained. Now, Brandon Ingram states that the reason why he jumped into the fight is because he was standing afar off and he saw five Houston Rocket players and two L.A. Laker players. So the first thing that he thought was, let me jump in and throw some punches. <laughs> By this, I think is wrong. Not, I don't want to encourage it, kids. Don't fight. It was entertaining. I mean, that's why we're talking about it. Brandon Ingram's a live wire. That kid is a live wire. Stephen A. Well, you know what they say about the quiet people, right? <laughs> they always claim, quote unquote, the quiet guys are the ones that you have to watch. Uh, quiet people tend to be the ones that are not going to tell you before they strike. They're just going to strike. A, he, like, you know, James Harden comes down the lane. He gets away with a lot of stuff. He manipulates the rules. That's why he's a great player. Well, no, he doesn't manipulate the rules. He manipulates the referees because the referees are the ones who have to establish the rules. They're the ones who have to make appropriate player evaluations and say, well, James Harden likes to flop. He likes to initiate contact and act like he's the one getting fouled. Let's not give him all these whistles. But it's very clear that they act like they don't know what he does. And it doesn't it doesn't really do him any 
any good service because he gets to the playoffs and the refs start giving him all those bullshit calls and then he becomes a far less proficient player. So it's only hurting him. You know, just like a batter in baseball who draws walks. That's not why balls and strikes are there. They're there to encourage the pitcher to throw strikes so the batter can swing. But smart hitters have manipulated the rule and use it to their advantage to draw walks. That's like players drawing contact in the NBA. That's not why fouls are there to put a guy on the line. They're there to dissuade fouling. But smart offensive players like Harden use it to draw fouls. And the way he did it against Ingram bothered Ingram. He got shoved around. I mean, my advice to Ingram was, kid, hit the weight room harder. Guys, are, you know, you'd be a better player. And it's still young, and I think he will, and he'll get stronger as he gets older. But he doesn't like the way he's getting tossed around. But Ingram is a live wire. He goes to the MVP of the league, who he just fouled, and shoves him aside. And then the one thing that I re I, I, I kind of... It's not that I'm encouraging the behavior, but I like seeing that feistiness in a young player. There were some other things that were getting under the skin of the Lakers, though. I, I, would, I would suppose that not only the physicality of the game, the intensity of the game, and probably also the trash talk was getting to a lot of the younger players. Young player. The problem I had with Ingram, Stephen A., is the way he approached the ref. He looked like he had beef with the ref, like he was physically intimidating. And the ref was like, what? Well, he was frustrated by the fact that the ref was trying to act as if he did not see what was being done on the basketball floor. Luke Walton stated after the game that the level of intensity ratcheted up after that clothesline. So according to Luke Walton, they said, OK, so we're going to play like that. And oftentimes when you have inexperienced teams that are not accustomed to that level of tenacity and intensity in games, they can lose their heads. It happens. What? Are you kidding, kid? You just fouled the MVP, then you shove him, and I call a foul, which is the right thing, and you're in my face? I didn't like that from Ingram. But, but he really started the whole thing. Well, and then when it was all over, he jumps in and punches Chris Paul in the face. Now, let me say this. If I'm Chris Paul, I'm thinking, I agree with that, Tony. You got to be kidding. A dude spits in my face. I don't even really retaliate. I just put my hands in his face like, don't spit in my face. He punches me in the face twice. When it's all over, the kid who started the whole problem comes and punches me in my face again, and I'm suspended because I threw a punch. I agree, Stephen A., you're not allowed to throw a punch. You have to do something, so they suspended him. I think if I were the commissioner in this case, I would look at it and say, I'm not giving Chris Paul a suspension. Well, let me well I would give Chris Paul a suspension. I would have gave him two games because we don't know what he was saying that may have and Rajon Rondo's mind crossed the line. Well, I would have given Chris Paul a suspension, but I would have tried to minimize it. One game at the very least, but I probably would have given him two games because I would have given Rajon somewhere around eight games and I would have given Brandon Ingram 10 games. Ingram has to get 10 games. Not only did he start everything, but then he ran in and tried to involve himself and really escalate a fight into a brawl because actions like what he committed that's what turns fights between two guys where other players are breaking up into a big brawl. Because what if P.J. Tucker sees that and says, what the fuck is this dude doing? And then goes and, and japs Brandon Ingram. Now all of a sudden, Lance Stevenson, he, <laughs> he might want to get involved. And what's funny is that Lance Stevenson, he had one of the cooler heads out there. So the guys who are supposed to be the leaders, Ray John Rondo, he's supposed to be the leader. He's supposed to have a cool head. For him to do that, that's not good. And I guarantee you that there's going to be a fissure between Rajon and, and LeBron James over this. There's no doubt in my mind. Well, let me say this to you. You're entitled to your emotions and your expressions, and I get that. But I can assure you, uh, talking to players after the game, talking to a lot of people in the league, and my personal feelings covering the NBA and what have you, I can get your point about the entertainment aspect um, in terms of the vitriol that two combatants have for one another. But where it goes off the rails and where nobody's smiling and talking about the entertainment aspect is when it comes to Chris Paul having spit in his face. That's my point. That's why I state that if you really listen to what people like Max Kellerman state, and that's why I always try to hone in on his liberal Caucasian Jew aspect and how he tries to placate blacks when it's really just a manifestation of the white man's burden mentality. And in all reality, he really holds the so-called black man in great disdain in his subconscious. He just tries to fight it and keep it from bubbling up into his conscious mind. For him, for him to lead his statement by talking about how entertaining it was and how great it was, a dude got spit in his face, man. Once again, you call fights for a living. If I want to see a fight, I'll put on a boxing match. 
I don't need to see two guys fight on the basketball court. I've never seen a basketball fight that I felt compelled to go watch again. First off, the technique is not there. There's no art to it. And oftentimes it's haphazardly, it's chaotic, and people can get seriously hurt. I like to see, I like to see competition with fervor. I don't need to see basketball players fighting. That's just crossing the line. And you had a lot of people that were, sit, were, were, were adopting the mindset, what the hell are you doing? I mean, again, I didn't know immediately because I saw the replays, but it was in real action or what have you. And I had to go on Sports Center immediately after the game. Uh, but in the hours that followed, seeing the replay over and over again, and then having it slow mode for me, which the highlight didn't necessarily do uh, initially. Uh, by, the, by, by the teams themselves to see it in slow motion and to see Chris Paul's head jerk back to see Rondo's head jerk forward you, it definitely looked like it was intentional and the second you start talking about spitting in somebody's face no as doubt. a subject matter there is nothing so would you, about so that would you, would you suspect that's what I'm saying because he got spat on that to me is a good enough reason to put your hand without even punching in someone's face then he got punched twice and then at the end of the fight, he got punched and in between. He threw one punch in self-defense. I, even though you're not allowed to retaliate and everything, if I'm the commissioner, I use discretion and say I'm not suspending well, Chris Paul. I, I can't say that because there is a certain space for the letter of the law. At the end of the day, I'm sure that the NBA did their due diligence in their investigations, and you never know what they found out. What if they found out that CP3 said something to Ray John about his family or something along those lines? Of course, I'm not saying that that's what he did. But you never know what someone says to another person. Is that an excuse for Ray John Rondo to spit in his face? Absolutely not. But it was very obvious that CP3 was trying to get in the face of Ray John, and Ray John was trying to get into the face of CP3. And these are two players that have a history. And they have a bitterness between them. There's no doubt about that. And sometimes it can come from jealousy. Sometimes it can come from insecurity. You know, CP3 is someone who wants what Rajon Rondo has, that being a championship ring. Rajon Rondo, for all intents and purposes, he wants what CP3 has, which is to be considered the best pure point guard in the league and a definite Hall of Famer. To be quite honest with you, I think that Rajon Rondo has put his Hall of Fame candidacy in doubt with a lot of his exploits on many of these different teams across the NBA. So we'll see what happens. There's a reason why oftentimes two players will have a certain level of antipathy. But just to get back to the point, I definitely would have given CP3 at least one game, maybe two games. But what I definitely would have done is I would have given Rajon Rondo about eight games and I would have given Brandon Ingram about 10 games. I did not get into the 